Don't buy the Kool-Aid from Al Gore's Kool-Aid stand and go, well, I guess that's how it's gonna be. How will we survive the coming shortage of imaginary virtue? I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, and this episode of Right Angles brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And gentlemen, this is the looming crisis, and I wanna first of all comfort our viewers that uh, the crisis is not here yet but it is coming soon. Uh, right now, we actually have a surplus of imaginary virtue. I'm sorry, um, my notes say carbon credits. We have a surplus of carbon credits, uh, some 750 million uh, credits in surplus. Um, and to give you an idea of what that marketplace is like, last year, 156 million carbon credits were sold or purchased uh, by companies who are uh, pumping carbon out into the atmosphere and uh, can't restrain themselves. So instead of actually stopping the carbon that they're pumping out into the atmosphere, they buy carbon credits from other organizations or companies um, and basically say, it is as if we had reduced our carbon output into the, into the atmosphere because we bought uh, these credits from somebody who was not pumping carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, Stephen Green, uh, this is quite a challenge because there's some 9 billion tons of this stuff being pumped out there from 900 companies around the United States. And in, a very, uh, in the very near future, based on the reports of companies that have made pledges to reduce their carbon output um, and the growing uh, use of land for other purposes that make it not as useful for absorbing carbon, uh, Steve, where are we going to find these this imaginary virtue uh, at a time when it's just all been used up? Or frankly, will companies be able to afford these carbon credits as the cost goes up and up as the as the dearth of them becomes apparent? Right now, I'm thinking of Willy Wonka singing "Pure Imagination," and I'm just I'm <laughs> loving it. I love that movie. I love Gene Wilder. I love the song. So thank you for that. That is kind of what we're dealing with here. Actually, Scott, you gave me an idea. I am going to be a billionaire. I mean, no joke. I'm going to make billions and billions of dollars because I've come up with a plan for selling NFTs of uh, carbon credits that can be traded for Bitcoin, right? <laughs> That's genius. That is kind of genius. Yeah. <laughs> Actually. <sighs> Yeah, I'm leaving all this behind me, baby. I'm buying a, I'm buying an island, getting a private jet. Oh no, I'm supposed to be, uh, I'm supposed to be getting rid of my carbon. Okay, so I'm gonna sequester carbon by uh, blowing up balloons every day and just stuffing my office full of them. So every time I exhale, I'm gonna exhale into a balloon and 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 tie it shut and sequester all of that carbon, and then I'm going to apply for uh, uh, my carbon credits, my tax refund. What what is it you get? This is what I don't understand. We have all these imaginary schemes and the net result is uh, very little. We know how to reduce the country's carbon footprint. We know how to do this. It's very easy. Stop closing nuclear reactors and start mm. building new ones. If we're not doing that, we are indeed, Scott, living in a realm of pure imagination. Yeah, Bill Whittle, I guess uh, maybe it's just because I'm such a geezer, but I remember when they first started talking about these carbon credit markets and it just seemed like monopoly money to me. Um, and maybe not that real. I mean, at least monopoly money can get you a little green plastic house. Uh, but it just seemed like they were just making stuff up. And now that they've made stuff up, now they're telling me that they don't have enough of the stuff they made up. <laughs> And so um, it, the, a carbon credit, by the way, for those uh, playing the home game, um, is equal to the reduction or removal of one ton of carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, my little brother, who's invested in some real estate over the years, says that you, you should buy land because you can't get hurt with dirt. Um, they're not making any more of it. And actually, this is part of the problem. Uh, and part of the shortage of carbon credits is the, they're not making any more dirt. And the dirt that they we have out there is being put to uses that prevent it from having plants on it that uh, suck up the carbon carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, so, like solar plants? Bill, this ties in. That's right. Um, Bill, this ties in with another story I saw th uh, that was talking about the coming shortage of lithium. Um, and uh, so many of these batteries uh, that are powering everything now, including our automobiles, are using lithium. And 
you know, you're a great proponent of free markets. In the past, in history, we've noticed that demand creates supply. And the naysayers who said the automobile would never take off because there were no gas stations were mm -hmm. proven wrong because the existence of automobiles, in effect, created gas stations. Uh, what do you see happening when it comes to things like carbon credits and lithium for batteries? Well, let me start with the carbon credits. Uh, you know, in 2005, when An Inconvenient Truth uh, came out, uh, in, shortly thereafter, Al Gore went from being politician rich to captain of industry rich. I mean, he, he, he added at least two figures to his, to his income because he was, and, and I hope everybody's sitting down, for those of you who are easily, you know, get the vapors, find your fainting couch. Because uh, as it turns out, once this idea of selling carbon credits came out, Al Gore was a guy you could actually buy them from. Hmm. And that and that worked out rather well for him. As far, the final thing I'll say about carbon credits is if I bought a, if I bought a carbon credit for a ton of carbon, I would say, okay, um, I've got the receipt. I just want you to just leave the carbon ton out back. <laughs> <laughs> just just press it into a cube and and just I'm just going to stack them in my parking lot. But since I've paid you to remove a ton of carbon from the air, I want to see the ton. It's not unreasonable. I want to see the ton. Where's the ton of carbon? Now, this kind of thing goes to show just how fantastical the whole thing is. As far as the lithium goes, look, I'm not against electric cars. My understanding, I know for a certain fact is from an engineering point of view, that an electric car can accelerate so quickly to break your neck. The, the, the torque available is just fantastic. I'm not against them on principle. In fact, since they essentially have one moving part, uh, I think they'd be grand. But we're not talking about markets here. We're talking about either government mandates or, in, and in the, this is the, the one in the case of, of uh, um, the carbon credits, or social blackmail. Um, and... I saw some, just, just, this will take just one second. Was it, I don't know if I saw it on, yeah. No, I saw something somewhere like on a Google page or something and it said carbon neutral since 2007. Wow. It's wow. pretty impressive. Um, okay. So, so you create this phony crisis that's going to not just be a crisis, it's going to kill the planet. And then you tell people they can save the planet, not just their own lives or money or anything, you know, Philistine like that. You save the whole planet uh, by doing this thing, which is basically shutting down uh, all of this industry. And one of the ways you can actually save the planet is by sending the people who are telling you that the planet is dying large sums of money. And somebody somewhere... I think this must have happened right around 2005. Somebody somewhere must have sat down and said, you know, we could, if, if we could actually get people to buy, to have carbon removed. From, come on. No, seriously. You're, but what are you offering them? We're, we're offering them uh, an assurance. Nobody's going to be that stupid. Oh, I bet they will. I bet they will. Because now, now you can say that we're, we're this is green, we're carbon neutral, we're carbon. It's it's all as you said. It's just a giant virtue signal, and it is. It is a, it's like an iron triangle, Scott. Right. So you got the people who saying that this global warming is going to kill the planet, and then you got people saying, well, what can I do about it? My corporation, I want my corporation to look good. It's a public relations issue. Well, we can sell you this carbon credit so that you can say that you're green, which means that now I'm complying with the green that contributes to the idea that the planet is dying, and around and around and around we go. Um, the, 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 the most effective way to uh, remove carbon from the atmosphere is to just stand back and, and watch the plants grow faster. When carbon dioxide levels are higher, plants grow faster, they require less water, and then the plants drink up the carbon and spit out the oxygen. It's almost like there was a feedback loop in place to prevent the earth from becoming a wasteland. Hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's, um, 
it would be comical if it weren't so real and, and millions, if not billions of dollars being spent every year for this charade that is in effect uh, corporate hush money. It's Shell Oil saying, I'll tell you what, if I give you this money, will you tell everybody, well, can, I, can I use this little uh, sticker on my products that says that, uh, that we have net zero emissions, for example. But in some cases, in many cases, that net zero is achieved through net zero zero change in the overall quantity of carbon in the atmosphere because the people selling the carbon credits are often selling something that they're, they've been doing anyway. So it's not like they made some change. They said, hey, we're sucking yes. carbon out of the atmosphere already. The farmer who's got 6,000 acres of land says, I'll tell you what, we'll let uh, 2,000 of these remain fallow and uh, and that will absorb carbon or whatever. And we'll, yeah, and then I'll get paid for doing that. We didn't make any substantive change. We just l allowed one party to pay another party so that the first party could brag that he's doing something constructive for the environment. Now, I'm not saying people shouldn't be concerned about the environment or shouldn't do anything to reduce their impact on it. Obviously, we all would like to remain, uh, have clear skies and clean water and things like that that we can rely on on a regular basis. But let's not kid each other. I mean, let's not play these little pretend games that make it seem like somehow if I pay you, then the pollution I'm pumping into the air is it magically disappears. It does not. Um, so the the coming shortage of something that doesn't really exist struck me as a really as a as a comical headline. But I do believe. And, and I don't know the source where this is coming from. I believe when it comes to carbon credits and when it comes to lithium for batteries or just whatever you're going to make batteries of in the future, I believe that the demand is going to create a supply from an unforeseen source. Now, I'm hoping in the case of carbon credits that the supply will actually come substantively. It will be something that's really doing the job and helping to make the air cleaner, for example. Uh, when it comes to lithium batteries, who knows what they're going to invent? I mean, if you told me 50 years ago, it's like, oh, you're going to be able to carry a supercomputer in your pocket that doesn't burn a hole in your leg, uh, <laughs> despite the fact that it's using all this power and energy, I'd have been like, oh my goodness, what, I got to carry a 12-volt battery on my shoulder? Heck, I used to carry a music device on my shoulder. <laughs> So remember how heavy awesome. C and D battery cells used to be? <laughs> so there are, there are amazing things happening today. And all I would say is don't anchor yourself to the first idea that came down the pike. Don't buy the Kool-Aid from Al Gore's Kool-Aid stand and go, well, I guess that's how it's going to be uh, for the indefinite future. All, we're always looking for new solutions. We're always looking for better ways. We want to have ways that we can drive literally at breakneck speed, as Bill described. <laughs> um, and it's every time I see a Tesla on the road, there's a little part of me that goes, Daddy want, you know. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> um, so, you know, I'm all, I'm all for that. And I'm all for us finding better ways uh, to create energy. But let's, let's be honest with each other and say, hey, if we're pumping nine billion tons of this stuff into the air each year. Is there a way that we could pump 8 billion tons into the air next year and still be able to satisfy our power needs? And let's find legitimate ways to do that instead of playing this three-card Monty game where we pretend we're doing something that we're not really doing. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible. 